talks um, of, you know, they're not really talks, I guess, they're more like just me reading books. So, um, there's a lot of really old, really great paranormal books out there, and written by some very famous, and some maybe not as famous, or slightly forgotten, uh, paranormal investigators of the past, and it's all really interesting, and stuff in some of these and so what I'll be doing is reading or at least attempting to read these some of these books so for people who don't really have the time to read or don't, aren't available to read like to read listen to audio while they do things then this could be for you I am fairly new or really new to this so I'm sure it will improve as I go along, I hope it will, I hope it's good enough to start off with, to get you involved, and uh, as I say, it, it will get better, uh, just learning how to do this, so I hope the, uh, it'll be a little interesting thing to do. So here it is, the first book will be a Harry Price book, based on his 10 years at the Borley Rectory in Borley, England, and we'll, I will do a couple more books and I'll do chapters as, ma as much as I can every day or as much as I can anyway. So. That's Haunted House in England, 10 Years Investigation of Borley Rectory by Harry Price. Preface. I have done little more than edit the remarkable records that constitute the major portion of this monograph. The evidence for the haunting of Borley Rectory is mostly in documentary form, and where possible, I have reproduced verbatim the oral and written testimony, which, in nearly every case, is first-hand. As I am merely the narrator of this story, I cannot, of course, assume responsibility for the validity of these incidents that did not come within my own personal experience. Without the kindly cooperation of a great number of people, this book could never have been written. I desire to put on record my sincere thanks to all those who helped me in compiling it. Especially, I am grateful to the following persons. The Mrs. Bull, Mr. Walter Bull, and the Bull family generally. For permission in to print their experiences and for their hospitality in many ways. The Reverend G. Eric Smith, the Reverend L. A. Foister, and the Reverend A. C. Henning successively rectors of Borley, and their wives for much help and hospitality during my ten years' investigation. To Mr. Foister, I am especially indebted for permission to reproduce extracts from his diary. To Lady Whitehouse and her nephew Dom Richard Whitehouse, OSB, I am grateful for contributing two of their most interesting and convincing chapters in this book. By courtesy of the editors of The Times, The Month and The Daily Mirror, I have been able to reproduce extracts from their journals, and Dr. C. E. M. Joad has kindly permitted me to quote his experiences. Originally related by him in Harper's Magazine, I am also indebted to the many correspondents of The Times, for permission to include their respective letters on the bricking up of nuns. Among those of my official observers to whom my thanks are specially due are Mr. Sidney H. Glanville, Mr. Mark Kerr Percy and Lieutenant Colonel F. C. Westlane. These gentlemen took infinite pains in making plans of the rectory, taking photos of the wall writings, etc., and in rendering help in a hundred ways. That they were strangers to me before my investigation began only adds to my indebtedness to them. Finally, I must thank all my official observers for the expenditure of time, trouble, and money, and in visiting Borley in the interest of science and for the care and skill in preparing their various reports and protocols. The fact that a few of these records were negative does not lessen my indebtedness to them. In, in conclusion, I must put on record my obligation to Captain W. H. Gregson for permitting me to chronicle his strange experiences and for his assistance rendered both before and after the fire that consumed the rectory, an event that so dramatically brought down the curtain on the most extraordinary and best documented case of haunting in the Annals of Physical Research. Chapter 1. Luncheon Interlude. 
On Tuesday, June 11, 1929, I was having lunch at a friend's house in South Kensington when his telephone bell rang. We had reached the coffee stage and I remember we were discussing why poltergeister, in spite of their mischievous and annoying tricks, never appear to harm anyone. They are merely playful and troublesome. Before we had solved the problem, a maid entered the room and said I was wanted on the telephone. Excusing myself, I walked into the hall to answer the call. It was from the editor of one of the London dailies, and the matter was somewhat urgent. It appeared that he had rung up my office, had spoken to my secretary, who had given him my friend's telephone number. The editor was rather excited. One of his staff, Mr V.C. Wall, was at the moment investigating the remarkable incidents that were occurring at a rectory about 60 miles from London. The rectory in question was that of Borley, two and a half miles from Long Melford, Suffolk, and the same distance from Sudbury. But just within the Essex border, the most extraordinary things were happening at Borley Rectory, and the editor asked me whether I would take care to visit the scene of these occurrences and take charge of the case. I thanked him very much and said I would make immediate arrangements to join his representative. I was told that the incumbent of Borley was the Reverend G.E. Smith. As I replaced the receiver, I little dreamt that there was ten years' work ahead of me, probing the mystery of what was to become the most authenticated case of haunting in the annals, annals of physical research. Chapter 2. The Adventures of a Journalist When I returned to my office after lunch, I saw that the midday post had arrived, and amongst my usual delivery of press cuttings, I found the clippings from the Monday morning's papers, giving an account of the bawling happenings up to the previous, previous Sunday night, which Mr Wool had telephoned to his papers. Here is Mr Wool's report. Ghostly figures of headless coachman and a nun, an old-time coach drawn by two bay horses, which appears and vanishes mysteriously, and dragging footsteps in empty rooms. All these ingredients of a first-class ghost story are waiting investigation by psychic experts in Long Melford, Suffolk. The scene of the ghostly visitations is the rectory at Borley, a few miles from Long Melford. It is a building erected on the part of a site of a great monastery, which in the Middle Ages was the scene of a gruesome tragedy. The present rector, the Reverend G. E. Smith, and his wife made the rectory their residence in face of warnings by previous occupiers. Since their arrival, they have been puzzled and startled by a series of peculiar happenings, which cannot be explained and which confirm the rumours they heard before moving in. The first untoward happenings was the sound of slow dragging footsteps across the floor of an unoccupied room. Then one night, Mr. Smith, armed with a hockey stick, sat in the room and waited for the noise. Once again it came, the sound of feet and some kind of slippers treading on bare boards. Mr. Smith lashed out with his stick at the spot where the footsteps seemed to be, but the stick whistled through the empty air and the steps continued across the room. Then a servant girl brought from London suddenly gave Dan notice after two days' work, declaring emphatically that she had seen a nun walking in the wood at the back of the house. Finally comes the remarkable story of an old-fashioned coach seen twice on the lawn by a servant which remained in sight long enough for the girl to distinguish the brown colour of the horses. This same servant also declares that she has seen a nun leaning over a gate near the house. The villagers dread the neighbourhood of the rectory after dark and will not pass it. Peculiar enough is all these visitations coincide with the details of a tragedy, which according to legend occurred at the monastery which once stood at this spot. A groom at the monastery fell in love with a nun and a nearby convent runs the legend, and used to hold clandestine meetings in the wood, onto which the rectory now backs. Then one day they arranged to elope, and another groom had a coach waiting in the road outside the wood, so that they could escape. From this point the legend varies. Some say the nun and her lover quarrelled, and had he strangled her in the wood, and was caught and beheaded with the other groom for his villainy. The other version was that all three were caught in the act by the monks, and that the two grooms were beheaded, and the nun buried alive in the walls of the monastery. In the, the previous rector of Borley, now dead, often spoke a remarkable experience he had one night when walking along the road outside the rectory. He heard the clatter of hoofs. Looking around, he saw to his horror an old-fashioned coach hum, lumbering along the road, driven by two headless men. Mr Wall stayed at the rectory over the weekend and sent a further report of his adventures to London. Long Melford, Monday. With a photographer, I have just completed a vigil of several hours in the haunted wood, at the back of the Borley Rectory, a few miles from Long Melford. This wood and the whole neighbourhood of the rectory is supposed to be haunted by the ghosts of a groom and a nun who attempted to elope one night, several hundred years ago, 
what were apparently caught in the act. Although we saw only one of the manifestations which have, according to residents, occurred frequently in recent years, this by itself was peculiar enough. It was the appearance of a mysterious light in a disused wing of the building, an appearance which simply cannot be explained, because on investigation of the deserted wing it was ascertained that there was no light inside, although the watchers outside could still see it shining through a window. When we saw the mysterious light shining through the trees, we suggested that somebody should go into the empty wing and place a light in another window for the sake of comparison. The Reverend G. E. Smith, the rector who does not believe in ghosts, volunteered to do it. Sure enough, the second light appeared and was visible next to the other, although on approaching close to the building, this disappeared, while the rector's lamp still burned. Then we were left alone to probe the mysteries of the haunted wood. After reading Mr. Wall's accounts of his adventures at the rectory, I sent a telegram to the Reverend G. E. Smith, asking whether it would be convenient for my secretary and me to visit the rectory on the following day. In an hour or so, I received the necessary permission with the added invitation to arrive in time for lunch. Chapter 3. The Rector's Story On the following morning, Wednesday, June 12, 1929, my secretary, Miss Lucy Kay, and I prepared for our trip. In case the reader may wish to know what a psychic investigator takes with him when engaged on an important case, I will enumerate some of the items included in a ghost hunter's kit. Into a large suitcase I packed the following articles. A pair of soft felt overshoes used for creeping unheard about the house in order that neither human beings nor paranormal entities shall be disturbed when producing phenomena. Steel measuring tape for measuring rooms, passages, testing the thickness of walls and looking for secret chambers or hiding holes. Steel screw eyes, lead post office seals, ceiling tool, strong cord or tape, and adhesive surgical tape. For ceiling doors, windows or cupboards, a set of tools with wire nails, etc. Hank of electrical flex, small electrical bells, dry batteries and switches for secret electrical contacts. 9cm by 12cm reflex camera, film packs and flash bowls for indoor or outdoor photography. A small portable telephone for communicating with an assistant in another part of the building or garden, notebook, red, blue and black pencils, sketching block and a case of drawing instruments for making plans, bandages and then a flask of brandy in case a member of investigating staff or resident is injured or faints, a ball of string, stick of chalk, matches, electrical torch and candle, a bowl of mercury for t detecting tremors in a room or passage or for making silent mercury switches. Cinemagraph camera with remote electrical control and films. A sensitive transmitting, sensitive transmitting thermograph of charts to measure the slightest variation in temperature in supposed haunted room. A packet of graphite and soft brushes for developing fingerprints. For a long stay in house with supply of electricity, I would take with me infrared filters, lamps and cinefilms sensitive to infrared rays so that I could take photographs in almost complete darkness. For special cases, as in my broadcasts from the haunted manor at MFM Kent, I use an electric signalling instrument, which automatically reveals to the investigator, who has no need to leave his base room, a movement of any object in any part of the house or a change in temperature in the controlled rooms. Speeding northwards, I turned over in my mind the best way to tackle the bawly problem, and by the time we reached Chelmsford, I had formulated a plan of campaign. We got to Sudbury at midday and found we could no longer continue our route unaided. We stopped and asked the way. A dozen willing guides immediately put us on the right road and even offered to accompany us. The Borley Ghost was almost the sole topic of conversation for miles around and the good people of Sudbury were consumed with curiosity as to what we intended to do and how we intended to do it. A mile or so out of Sudbury on a long Melford Road we saw a signpost to Borley and in a few minutes, our car entered the, one of the drive gates leading to the rectory. I was astonished at the great size of the house. We were welcomed by Reverend G.E. Smith and his wife, very charming and hospitable, and I should like to take this opportunity of thanking them publicly for their interest in my investigation, and for the assistance they rendered during my prolonged inquiries. During lunch, I heard the whole story of their adventure. It tallied with what Mr. Wall had printed in his paper, but the following is a more detailed account as it is the epitome of a number of interviews with Mr. Smith by one of my helpers, Mr. S. H. Glanville, and myself. 
living of Borley had been offered to and refused by twelve clergy before Mr. C Mr. Smith accepted the living. He went into residence at the la latter part of 1928. He was not informed that the rectory was alleged to be haunted. The house was found to be excessively cold and difficult to heat. The water supply was quite inadequate for their needs, there being no pipe supply inside the house. All water had to be obtained from a well. The house was so large that some of the upstairs rooms were not needed and were permanently closed. The place was depressing and Ms. Mrs. Smith became ill. Soon after, after Mr. Smith and his wife moved into the rectory, certain minor demonstrations of a supposed psychic nature occurred. For example, one summer afternoon, when Mr. Smith was alone in the house, he left his bedroom, and upon passing under the archway leading to the landing, heard distinct sibilant whisperings over his head. He was at a loss to account for this, and walked slowly across the landing, followed by the sounds. As he passed under the archway leading to the chapel, the sounds instantly ceased as though a wireless set had been switched off. Though there was no radio instrument in the neighbourhood, he returned across the landing, but nothing further was heard. These sounds were heard several times afterwards, though no words were dis distinguishable. Upon another occasion at dusk, when he was crossing the landing, he was startled at hearing a woman's voice, again coming from apparently from the centre of the arch leading to the chapel. The voice started with a moaning sound, gradually rising into a crescendo, and ending with the words, Don't, Carlos, don't! Dying away in a sort of volume of the sound at its highest pitch was slightly louder than would be used in ordinary conversation. Carlos, by the way, was supposed to be a nickname by which the builder of the rectory was known, though this is denied by surviving members of his family. Other phenomena experienced at the rectory included mysterious bell ringing, the slow and deliberate footsteps that patrolled the passages and upstairs rooms, and the apparitions seen by the two maidservants successively employed by Mr. Smith. When Mrs. Smith was returning from church one night after dark and was entering the house by the back or scullery door, she noticed that the window of the schoolroom was lighted up and presumed that the maid was there with a the lamp. Upon entering the house, she found the maid in the kitchen. The girl told her mistress, mistress that she had not been upstairs at all. They therefore went up together and found the room in darkness. The same thing happened on a later occasion when the choir had just finished their evening practice. Mr. Smith took all the members of the choir and showed them the lighted window. Then they all went up to the rooms, but the but it was again in darkness. Mrs. Smith also told us that when she was has been in the dairy in the evening, she often saw a figure leaning over the, one of the drive gates. The figure was always dark and shadowy. She several times went out to investigate, but never found anyone there. This particular figure, leaning over this particular gate, had been seen by various people who all speak of its strange and sudden dis disappearance. One of the maids employed by the Smiths was quite definite that saw the traditional coach. One afternoon she ran to some Mr Smith with the news that she had seen such a funny old coach on the lawn. The press photographer took pictures of her pointing the exact spot where it disappeared and the girl herself told me the same story. Another maid, the one they brought from London, saw a figure dressed in black leaning over the gate. It so frightened her that she stayed only two days. Very curiously, Mr. Smith heard many more strange noises in the winter than in the summer. As to poltergeist phenomena, the most peculiar was the shooting from the locks of their keys, found usually two or three feet away. This happened periodically, and I too witnessed this phenomenon. On, other on another occasion, a vase that normally stood on the mantelpiece of their bedroom was found smashed to pieces at the foot of the main stairs. No one was in the house at the time, the Smiths being in the garden. Curious sounds of various parts of the house were heard from time to time. But except for the figure leaning over the gate, nothing was seen that could not be accounted for. During the first few weeks of the tenancy, before they had actually moved in, Mrs. Smith was turning out the various rooms when in a cupboard in the library she found a parcel neatly wrapped and tied with string. Upon removing the wrapping, she was astonished to find the skull of apparently a young woman. It was in perfect condition and the teeth were also perfect. Failing to find any reason why the skull should be preserved in the library, Mr. Smith and the sexton reverently buried it in the churchyard in the presence of the church warden and the widow of the previous rector. By the time we had finished lunch, I had heard the whole story of the manifestations, the history of the rectory, the various legends connected with the place, and other information, which will be dealt with fully in subsequent chapters. I found the Smiths very intelligent, delightful, and much-travelled people, who were, like myself, utterly sceptical as regards to spirits. They knew nothing about physical research, and the subject did not particularly interest them. Though puzzled by what they had seen and heard, that they, being God-feared people, 
not afraid that anything would harm them. What finally drove them from the rectory was the lack of amenities there, and not the ghosts, but I am in good faith.